this is a terrific documentary. I'm really happy to be here talking about it with you. Um, as Carol said, uh, it airs on HBO May 18th. There's also a companion photo exhibition going up at the Ben Ruby Gallery on May 14th. And uh, I just saw the gorgeous book version of the project backstage, um, which you should also check out. Um, but the trick is, you haven't seen any of any of this, and we have. So, uh, <laughs> uh, unlike spoiler a, alert, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. <laughs> that's right. uh, so, unlike those talks after a screening of a film, we're going to try to sort of walk through uh, the three stories of this film because there's really three threads, and uh, and get into it. And and also, more than the th the three stories themselves are complex enough, but the actual story of how this film comes together is is just as fascinating to me. And uh, it goes all the way back to 2002, right? Is it fair to say, Jillian, that this film wouldn't exist if you hadn't received a letter at Spin Magazine in 2002? So, um, yes, that's very fair to say. Um, a very brave student at Montgomery County High School wrote a letter to Spin Magazine, not me. <laughs> um, Spin was... Uh, uh, a magazine that she subscribed to, and she, it was a cry out for help. She said, please come to my town. They're having segregated proms. I can't take my boyfriend to the prom because he's black and I'm white. Mm. Please come to my town, show the world what's happening. So um, that is how this all began. You re keep returning. So then in 2009 yeah. here at the New York Times Magazine, Yes. You, you returned for another story, a prom, div uh, prom divided, is that? Yes, well I returned before, mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately I was kicked out, um, chased out of town um, years before, but uh, so it wasn't fair to only tell, because I only had access to the black prom, um, and I didn't think it was fair to tell just one side. So it wasn't until 2009 that I got access to the white prom and, and white students and parents talked to me and were opening up to me about it. So um, that's when the, the story got published in the New York Times Magazine in 2009. And this shocks people, of course, right? Because it's, <laughs> it's shocking. This is 2009 and literally uh, one night in the same building they're having a, a prom for, which, which is first, is it the? So what they call the white folks prom was mm -hmm. on a Friday night in the Vidalia Community Center and the Black folks prom was on the following night. And when, and when you first heard of this <laughs> going on, what, was your, what did you make of it? I was shocked just like everybody else, you know? Uh, I know that racism is real and racism is lived in America, but I didn't know people were being so blatant about it <laughs> still. <laughs> and uh, for, for me to know that this was happening um, in the 21st century was so shocking, but as a, producer uh, and running a, f a film company, I was like, wow, this is amazing. We got to tell this story because uh, it's such an interesting relic from the past to have this story available to us now. This is not, mm -hmm. you know, Selma. This is, this, is, this is not 50 years ago history. This is today. I feel like every time I thought I had a beat on what this film was the first time watching it, I was surprised by where it took me next. Um, and Jillian, I know it sounds like you were surprised yourself as, as the film evolved. It goes from being a film about prom to being a, a sort of a three prom, three prong story. Prom is just one of them. Um, do you want to talk about how the the local election, the local sheriff's race, becomes the second storyline? So one of the students that I met and completely fell in love with at the prom, and I actually met her in 2002 as well, Kiki Burns. Um, Amazing. She. Everybody loves Kiki. You'll love her once you watch the movie. She it's is. True. <laughs> true. She is so lovable, and in fact, I met her in 2008 um, outside of of school, and she was so excited. And she looked so familiar to me from 2002, and I, she said, I, and I, and I was like, what, what's going on? You know, I'm going to be the first black girl to go to the white folks prom. Mm -hmm. She was actually um, invited by her best friend, and and I said, oh. This is, this is the story. Can Please ask your parents, can I follow you? Because she's underage, so I had to ask their permission. Anyway, it turns out that um, she, she calls me late that night, hysterical crying, hysterical that she was actually disinvited to the prom because her best friend Dylan, um, 
his mom didn't feel comfortable with it. So anyway, Kiki, I knew she was gonna be um, somebody that I wanted to follow. And um, she said, will you come back to, to the black folks prom in a few weeks? And I said, absolutely. So when I told her what had happened, that I was very scared and I got chased out of town, she said, um, don't worry, my dad is chief of police. He'll protect you. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Um, so that's when I, I started my relationship with her and her whole family and, um, and getting to know them, he told me that he really wanted to run to be sheriff and it was great because he felt like he could really do it this time. A few years back when he wanted to run for sheriff, he got many death threats at night. So he was too scared. He couldn't run for sheriff because his life and his family's life was threatened. The election and the proms are threaded through this whole film. Um, but the film really does become the story of Justin Patterson's murder. Um, and this scene is a young, he's a 22 year old who shot and killed by a 62 year old man named Norman Neesmith. He's black, the older man's white. Um, the outline of the facts has a whole lot in common with stories we've been reading about in the news and seeing on television. Um, but tell us about these two specific people and that night. Because uh, I think a lot of people here haven't heard the story of right. Patterson. Okay, so Norman E. Smith um, is the man that killed Justin Patterson. Um, Norman's daughter and her friend uh, invited Justin and his brother over late at night. They were being teenagers, like we've all been there, we've all done that. Um, and uh, Norman heard some noise in the middle of the night and woke up and took the gun out. Um, from his bed that he sleeps with next to his bedside table and went into his daughter's room and um, confronted the boys and um, threatened them. And they were scared out of their minds and ran for their lives. And that's when Justin was shot and killed. As you see, you know, obviously the context of this film has changed since you began working on it. Um, it's, this is a story that's been relevant for, you know, since <laughs> the history of America. But over the past year, obviously, you know, thanks to the Black Lives Matter campaign and, and social media, we're talking about these issues right now. Um, how do you hope this film will, will play into that discussion? What do you hope people will see in this film that they can take into those other discussions we're having about? Baltimore, Ferguson, and so forth. I can say one thing that is interesting. You know, when I um, learned about Justin's death, no one was covering it. No one. No one heard a, a thing. I, there, nothing in the newspapers. It wasn't for a year and a half, a year and a half later, um, I just was outraged. How can this be happening? How can no one be covering this? And um, so I kind of was that annoying person that stalked the New York Times and um, got in touch with the bureau chief in Atlanta and basically said, you got to, because there was, um, I don't want to give away anything, but anyway, I, I you know, asked the reporter to come down for something specific and finally it was covered. So to, in, in regards to your question, it's great, thank God, that people are starting to pay attention now you know, people are starting to pay attention. I don't know if it's because of camera phones and people are getting caught now, or that people are really starting to care, but this has been going on for a long time. I think <laughs> social media and the use of the camera phone has made a big difference because, like Jillian said, this has been going on for a long time. This, and, and we can't divorce any, any of these conversations from history. We have to think about the, the history of lynching in America. We have to think about the history of slavery. We have to think about the history of the KKK and, and basically state allowed um, uh, terror organizations that were routinely terrorizing black people throughout this country. And we cannot separate that history from these stories now because if we do, then we don't understand the context of it and understand the depth and the um, depth of the challenge, really. Um, but I think the difference is that we're seeing it now, and there's real proof. And um, I think what separates this film, I think, from the news coverage of all these other stories is you really get a lot of depth around what happened 
and you get a lot of depth around the victim, um, around Justin, around his family, which I, I still don't think we've gotten from most of these cases because of the format of CNN and MSNBC is not to go deep on, on the subject in the same way mm -hmm. that you would in a documentary film. And I think it's really important that we watch Justin's mother talk about who he was as a human being. It's really important that we see his uh, girlfriend talk about who he was as a human being. Um, because we have to see these kids as human beings with souls and with value, just like we think about for our own kids and for our own brothers and sisters and cousins and family members. We have to think of them like they're our family for us to, um, for us to really say that their lives matter. And I think that's what this film is able to do, is able to, it's able to let us see that his life really mattered.